Hello everyone and welcome back, I'm Philip Magnus and I love, love, love sci-fi. Science fiction is one of my favourite ever genres to read. What I love and treasure most in the genre are those novels which are rich in ideas. Today we're talking about just one such book, A Desolation Called Peace by Arkady Martin. It is a special novel and it means a lot to me. I hope that as you watch on, you will discover why. So let's get on with it, shall we? A Desolation Called Peace makes half or more of the sci-fi works I've read over the last few years seem woefully incompetent. Arkady Martin's second book is the sequel to the Hugo Award-winning A Memory Called Empire. Memory introduced us readers to Martin's masterfully crafted culture of Takes Kalan, which draws from many real-world empires and people to create something fresh and unique. Central concepts of the Takes Kalan lit slim, such as civilized people versus barbarians and the political importance of poetry, are borrowed from the Roman and Byzantine empires. The naming conventions of Takes Kalan's citizens is drawn from the Mixtec people of Orxaca, and the cultural dominance of this empire should be familiar to anyone who has experienced American cultural imperialism. So, everyone. I'm not 100% certain, and my copy of Empire is back home so I can check, but one aspect in which Desolation breaks the mould set by its predecessor is, it has four very different and well-defined point of view characters, rather than a single one. And the four unique sets of circumstances show varying elements of Texcalani culture. Machit and Tree Seagrass are our main characters returning from memory, and the two of them continue the conversation about cultural colonization, civilization versus barbarism, personhood. By the nature of the relationship defined throughout Empire, their perspectives are entwined. Now, the most important thing you need to know about those two characters is. I ship them eternally, and if you don't, you're a bad person. Bad, bad, bad. Mahit is still that outsider looking in, in love with the culture of the Empire and horrified by that love, hungry to be accepted as equal to the taste Kalan Litzlim. Boy, that's a difficult one to pronounce for me. Yet disdaining of the notion that she is any less of a person for her belonging to an outgroup. Wiser and with a thicker skin, thanks to the events in memory, Mahit nonetheless exhibits a raw vulnerability that left me speechless and, at times, in tatters. Tree Seagrass, whose nickname is Reed, cracked me up. Together with Mahit, the two of them are like saltpeter and sulphur. All they lack is a little charcoal, and Martin offers them plenty in the face of a first contact scenario that's as heavy on politics, linguistics and tension as memory was, yet offering plenty of levity too, laugh-out moments that are true to these characters, and evisceratingly hilarious. Every conversation between Mahit and Reed is heavy with implication, heady with sexual tension, weighed by secrets and hidden meaning. Plenty to love about these two, the envoy and her pet, the poet and the ambassador, as they take on this first contact scenario that will demand every effort from the both of them. The poetry of Tais Kalan takes a backseat as we are given a glimpse of the Empire's warriors, facing an invisible foe. Yautlek, nine hibiscus, leads a legion of six flagships against this enemy of the Empire's. The title of Yautlek is a sort of admiral, or supreme navy commander. At any rate, six flagships are an entirely lackluster force against this nebulous alien threat from the depths of unknown space. In Nine Hibiscus, we see once more that takes Kalani obsession with the past, in the perfect figure she strikes, in the loyalty she awakens, in the way she thrives whenever she's in charge of a crisis. Her second is Twenty Cicada, nicknamed Swarm, an unusual name for an unusual character and a member of a minority religion within the Empire. Keep an eye out for him, he's a special one. Imperial Heir, 8 Antidote, is our last POV character, and he is an absolute treat. An 11-year-old who feels fully the weight of expectations resting on him, Cure, as he is called by one of his teachers, has the perfect vantage point to offer an unguarded glimpse at the inner workings of Empire at the highest level. So much of his point of view section was heartfelt and funny and intriguing. 
takes Kalan and the Jewel of the World are seen through another lens entirely. The absolute highlights for me were the conversations Kyo had with 19 Adze and the Minister of War Tree Azimuth. These interactions serve to shape Antidote's moral identity, which is a pretty nifty thing to have, as far as future emperors are concerned. I would go remiss if I didn't speak of the personal importance of this book and its predecessor to me. Like Mahit, I'm a student of a culture that is not my own. The distance is not as great, of course, but it is there nonetheless. I'm not English, I'm not American, and yet I think in English more than I think in my own native Bulgarian. I know dozens of poems by Keats and Blake and Milton, but I barely remember the last time I cracked open a book of poetry in Bulgarian. In my apartment in Sweden, I do not own a single paperback in my own language. And if not for Arkady Martin's books, this might not have even occurred to me as strange. But the truth of the matter is, I have been colonised. Every single one of my friends, people I slip into conversation in fluent English with. What does that speak of but just this type of cultural colonisation? The values of our culture have been overtaken, misplaced by the values of a more dominating one. And that it is something to grieve, to quote Martin. Propaganda is fascinating when it's inside your own mind, or even... Mohit taught in Texcalanli, in imperial-style metaphor and overdetermination. She'd had this whole conversation in their language. Deliberately, she taught in Stationer. We're not free. And in that same language, Iskander agreed. There's no such fucking thing. More than any other work, more than any other thing in my life, really, this series has inspired me to pursue a master's degree in cultural studies. Fingers crossed I'll be accepted this year. By the end of the novel, traditions, central tenets of the Tezcalani culture, no less, will be uprooted. Deferring visions of empire will violently clash against one another, revealing both rot and things worth preserving. You will be endlessly surprised, as I was when I read Memory, and again when I read this one. Desolation is a novel without villains, without clearly demarcated good guys and bad guys, merely people with differing ideologies, modes of communication, conceptions of selfhood and personhood. Those same questions of conflicting loyalties and of civilization are once again at the fore of Martin's narrative, but a turn to the exploration of different angles of belonging and cultural dissemination. Granted, when I say there are no villains, I separate between narrative and my own strong dislike of certain characters. I won't give away much, but I will say... Dynafire, old man! A few funny tidbits added familiarity to what can at times be a distant speculative world, in particular the binging. The Teixtlani civilization has as much a sweet tooth as we do about binging content, so their strict preferences lie in the way of period dramas. Hello, of course they do, they come from a culture obsessed with the glories of the past, and in capturing those glories in poetic and literal repetition. The cultural... all the cultural capital is aimed towards capturing this recreation, recontextualization even. And it's done brilliantly well, might I add. A note before I conclude this. I have 16 pages of notes in my journal, half of them illegible because I stayed up until 3, 4 in the morning reading this, and the other half consists of... Ugh, my head and read. Please don't fight. Make up, make out instead. <sighs> I love those two. I can't recommend this enough. If you're ever looking for something more cerebral, tense and rich on those questions of cultural heterogeneity that are so interesting from the view of someone whose own culture has been displaced, skewered more than halfway out of orbit in a significant way by an all-pervasive domineering culture, I think it is one of the most important works of science fiction that I have read in recent years. And to be sure, it is well worth talking about. And this is why Academy Martin's The Desolation Called Peace is very much worth looking into, very much worth reading, as is A Memory Called Empire. In case you haven't read that one, I have a review of it. You are welcome to peruse the link down below in the description to go and read it. Of course, if uh, you enjoyed this video, please like it, share it with your friends, don't forget to leave a comment down below, 
and ring that bell button for notifications. What else is there left to say, but I'll see you next time. We're either talking about some Mark Lawrence one-word kill shenanigans, or uh, having another short. Who knows? I know I don't. Until next time. Bye!